And this is the Temple Complex at Lalabella in Ethiopia, carved out of solid rock. This is unbelievable. These are the monolithic rock cut churches of Ethiopia. Ethiopia was one of the first lands to accept Christianity. And as it states here, Lalibela is one of Ethiopia's holiest cities. Now, the layout and names of the major buildings in Lalibela are widely accepted, especially by local clergy. And the representation is of Jerusalem. Now, this is amazing because these are what are called monolithic structures. In other words, they are carved from one solid piece of rock. Seemingly impossible. But according to Graham Hancock's sign in the seal, the ancient myth says that men with red hair came and built those churches during the 12th and 13th centuries. Were these the Knights Templar? Now to understand what is going on here, we have to look at Lalibela, the church complex of the highlands of Ethiopia. Let's take a closer look. Now, when we go to the map, this is where we find the truth about the site of Lalibela. Now, much of this was actually obscured by these tents that they put over these sites. And this happened through the World Heritage. And I believe that much of this was to actually hide some of the things that were going on, some of the alignments. But when you look back, before they added these tents, you begin to see the truth emerge. Look at the layout and look at how extensive this lava carved rock is. And here's where we get a snapshot of more reality. This is George. George is the most famous of the rock hewn churches. And look at the alignment. Here we go all the way across the world to the World Trade Center. And we measure the very footprint of the World Trade Center. 119 degrees, as you can see here very clearly. So we have 119 and we have 116. Six is nine. Nine eleven backwards. This was a church of Christ, clearly suggesting that they already knew the demolition date when they broke ground about of the World Trade Center. Here it is, Lolly Bella. You cannot make this up. You cannot force it. It is what it is and as I told you 9-11 is Christ's birthday and that's why this church the side angle of the cut is actually at this degree alignment the Templars knew it the Freemasons know it now the implication here is that northern Europeans the Knights Templars, remember, they were from France, were the ones who had the knowledge, the technology to build these churches. What technology were they using? Where did they get their knowledge? What did they know that we don't know? Of the time, these churches were built for a very specific reason. They were built to consolidate religious faith in these centers. Make no mistake, people of the time, when they saw these feats of magic in their eyes of these amazing churches and the technology that was brought to bear to build these churches, it then held those groups of people in those areas within religious submission 
to the people who built these churches. Pope Clement V ordered the rounding up and destruction and killing of the Knights Templar. Why would he do that? Now Graham Hancock asserts in this book that the Knights Templar were in communication with the Salamnic dynasties of Ethiopia and that they were basically negotiating with the Ethiopian dynasty to have access to the Ark of the Covenant. Now here's where things get just really fascinating because if you've all seen the movie Braveheart, you'll remember that it's based off the story of Robert the Bruce, who was a Scottish king who won a battle to free his people. The battle at Bannockburn in 1314 in the film Braveheart. Now what they're saying here is that at that battle, that Robert the Bruce gave a safe haven to the Knights Templar during these years of prosecution and the Knights Templar then fought for Robert the Bruce in the Battle of Bannockburn and helped him win the battle but as you can see here it was remembered that the victorious Scots marched behind a tiny arc shaped reliquary at that famous battle. So apparently the Knights Templar had something to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Now we begin to examine the true motive of the Knights Templar. It seems that they were building churches with the knowledge that they had gained from their expeditions in Jerusalem and in Ethiopia and they were building these Gothic churches all across Northern Europe and using this church technology to build churches in Ethiopia. But we have to question the motive of the Knights Templar. Were they trying to gain access to the Ark of the Covenant to steal it from the Ethiopians? Was that their goal? Now, this is interesting because what Graham Hancock is asserting here is that the Knights Templar then transformed and evolved into the Freemasons. And he lays out a pretty good case here for that happening. The Portuguese Order of Christ and British Freemasonry were the means by which Templar traditions were preserved and carried forward into the distant future perhaps right even up to the modern times. So not only were the rock-hewn churches of Alibella carved during the time of the, of the Templars, if you look at the roof of the great edifice, there is a double cross that is one within the other, like the crosses of the Order of Christ. Remember, this was a Freemasonic type of offshoot of the Knights Templar. Now the story continues with Muslims attacking Ethiopia to try to steal the Ark of the Covenant. But they were unsuccessful because they were repelled by a Portuguese army of only 450 people. And the army was led by the son of Vasco da Gama, the famous explorer which just so happened to be a knight of the Order of Christ. Remember, this was an offshoot of the Templars, an offshoot of the Freemasons. And, and they repelled these Muslims year in and year out. But the Ark of the Covenant had been moved to safety in, on these islands, island monasteries on Lake Tana until after the attack by the Muslims. Now the Portuguese were successful in turning back the Muslims, but Graham Hancock says that there may have been an ulterior motive. There may have been the motive of them getting access to the Ark of the Covenant. It's important to note that many 
of Portuguese explorers, even Christopher Columbus, were members of these secret societies. And that the founding of America may have been the result of some kind of investigation or exploration based on biblical prophecy, based on things that the Knights Templar found, discoveries, the search for the Holy Grail, the search for the Fountain of Youth, and all of these other things that were involved in the history of these secret societies. And this is why all these resources were brought to bear to explore these lands. They were searching for something. Then Graham Hancock tells a story about a man named James Bruce who, after talking to the Ethiopian people, he finds out that this man was there in his expeditions to steal the cultural treasures of Ethiopia, namely the Book of Enoch. Also from the Imperial Repository at Gondar, he carried off an ancient copy of the Kebra Nagast. This was back in the 1700s is when the Scottish traveler made his expeditions under the guise of trying to find the source of the Nile River. But that was just a cover story. He was there to run off with the relics. Now many of you have asked me about the authenticity of the Book of Enoch. Graham Hancock addresses this. It says, prior to the 18th century, scholars had believed the Book of Enoch to be irretrievably lost, composed long before the birth of Christ, and considered to be one of the most important pieces of Jewish mystical literature. It was only known from fragments and from references to it in other texts. James Bruce changed all this by procuring several copies of the missing work during his stay in Ethiopia. These were the first complete editions of the Book of Enoch ever to be seen in Europe. This was in the 1700s, you guys. Ancient copies were found in Ethiopia. This is in addition to the ancient copy found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we have two sources now of the Book of Enoch. So in religious people tell you that oh, if it's not in the Bible then it doesn't count and the, the book of Enoch is is a lie they're completely wrong they have not done their research I learned that the book of Enoch has always been of great significance to Freemasons and that certain rituals dating back to long before Bruce's time identified Enoch himself with Thoth an Egyptian god of wisdom I then found a lengthy entry in the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, which recorded other relevant traditions of the order. For example, that Enoch was the inventor of writing. He taught men the art of building, and that before the flood, he feared that the real secrets would be lost, to prevent which he concealed the great, the grand secret, engraven on white oriental periphery stone in the bowels of the earth. The entry in the encyclopedia concluded with these words, The Book of Enoch was known to exist from very ancient times, and is continually alluded to by the fathers of the church. Bruce brought home three copies from Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. Now, we have to be careful here, because there were two Enochs. And, of course, the Freemasons are going to confuse the situation. Okay, They're going to attribute all of the bad Enochs attributes and history to the good Enoch. The bad Enoch was more associated with buildings and writings, which is what they say here. It even says in the book of Enoch that Penemu was one of the fallen angels who taught man writing. So how could Enoch teach men writing? Both could not have taught men writing. We also know that Enoch was the name of the first city that was built by Cain. Okay, so now you're starting to see the picture. 
there was an Enoch who built the first, uh, the, the first city was named Enoch long before the original Enoch lived on the planet. Now the book of Enoch talks about the real Enoch. It even gives the lineage long after Cain walked the earth. So there was a bad Enoch first, and then there was the good Enoch, who wrote the book of Enoch. But it's, as you can see here, the Freemasons are trying to confuse it. They're trying to make it sound like the bad Enoch is associated with the book of Enoch, and that's simply not the case. The monoliths of Lalibela, were they carved by the Templars? With the use of the Ark of the Covenant, How did this all play out? Did they have the secret knowledge? Were they trying to steal the Ark of the Covenant? These are the questions that we have regarding Lalabella. What we know for sure is that the amount of technology necessary for such feats, carving buildings out of solid lava into the ground, the technology must have been amazing. And this is something we should not take lightly or try to minimize. This was not done with chisels and hands. This was done with a power far greater than anyone can imagine. And then all of this points back to the first Jedi, Jedediah, Solomon. Take care and be safe, you guys.